Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat wrap up. These are just wrap ups where I talk about some books that I've read at some point in my past, contemporary for me, but this will get posted in a few months time. I've got quite a few I want to talk about this week, so I'm just kind of going to like go for it. I'm going to start with The Order of the Pure Moon Reflected in Water by Zen Cho. I was really excited to read this because I've previously only read Sorcerer to the Crown by her, but she's an author who has intrigued me because she writes such interesting things that are all a little bit different and exploring different genres, and I find that really fun. I really enjoyed this. This follows um, Gua Im, who is a votary of The Order of Pure Moon Reflected in the Water, and she kind of ends up um, tagging along with a group of thieves, or rather, she very much makes like them accept her as a presence in their group. Um, this Order of Thieves, um, our main perspective there is Tetsang, who is a guy, he's not the guy in charge of the Order, but he has been there quite a while, he's like quite established. Um, and there's a bit of a clash between these two figures, the thieves have their own thing that they're doing, um, and, and lots of things are revealed. Um, I really enjoyed this. It is riffing off of wuxia genre in some ways. Um, it's also, um, I was really pleasantly surprised by how funny I found this. There's a lot of, and I, I don't like using the word banter because it reminds me of like lads on tour kind of thing, but there's a lot of, um, I guess maybe like squabbling between Gua Im and Tetsang in a very like old married couple kind of way. And there's just, there was a lot of humor in this. There were a lot of like, um, there was just a lot of moments that made me chuckle that I wasn't expecting, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I did enjoy, like, the action as well, that was really fun. Mainly, I think, my main criticism of this, which is one that I think a lot of people will have, is just that I wish it was longer. Um, I, I didn't come away feeling like the story was unfinished, like, I, we told a story here, absolutely. I just came away wanting to just stay. And I was like, can we just, let's have another adventure. Let's do some more things. Because I got really invested in the world. And I was just really enjoying this, like, cast of characters and that kind of thing. And I would happily have just, like, carried on with them for longer. Um, but in many ways, that's a compliment. Because, it's, you know, if your criticism of something is, I wish there was more of it, that's not necessarily bad, is it? So um, for my second Zen show, I did enjoy this. I had a really fun time. And I will definitely be reading more of her work for sure. Um, after that, I want to talk about collection. This is Russian Magic Tales from Pushkin to Platonov, edited by Robert Chandler. This is exactly what it says on the tin. This is kind of goes through in time. We start with Pushkin, we end with Platonov. Haha, <laughs> who'd have thought? But um, one thing I really appreciate about this is that we go through in time, so you kind of get to see like an evolution of these people. But also, um, sh they, he gives like uh, little tiny intros to the authors. Um, Sometimes they're very short, other times they're quite long, but it gives you a lot of context, which I really appreciated, because most of my um, knowledge of Russian folk tales comes from retellings, which is not a bad thing, um, and I enjoy stories that are retelling Russian folk tales. It's just, I think that those things work really well if you have a grounding in the original folk tales, and you have a, you know, I can better appreciate when people are riffing off of things if I know what the things are. So um, it's not that I'm not familiar with anything to do with Russian folk tales, but I really appreciate having read this now. I have a much better understanding of some of these. Um, a lot of folk tales have like figures who who stories circle around, and you like even a lot of the ones in this. Sometimes they're a bit repetitious, and they have a very similar structure or a very similar turn of events. But it's just like, oh, how's it executed? What's the take this time? And then one thing I really particularly appreciated was, as this goes through, you come to people who are writing during the revolution and after the revolution and that kind of thing, and some of them were really consciously engaging with, um, like, how they were making points about the revolution through using folk tales. Others were punished for their folk tales that they recorded because the very nature of the folk tales has inherent things that were um, frowned upon during those times. And so because I had this biographical um, context for some of these pieces, it, made, it meant that I could really appreciate some of what was happening. My final fiction book that I want to talk about is Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. I read this on my Kindle. Um, I picked it up because I've heard really, really good things about it. It's uh, kind of a mystery. We follow Stevie, who um, has a place at this illustrious Ellingham Academy, which is this school that's up in this mountain in America. 
Um, um, but essentially, she's fascinating with, fascinated with the Ellingham case, which is Albert Ellingham, who founded the school, um, he received this letter from someone signed Truly Devious, and then the next day his wife and child were abducted, and um, like, essentially it's this mystery that has never been solved, and it's always fascinated people, and Stevie's whole thing is researching this mystery, and that's why she got accepted to the school. It's that mix of she's investigating this mystery from the past, but something happens in the present that brings it all much closer to home. Um, I enjoyed this book. I gave it a three out of five stars. I think one thing is, is that when people tell you that something is amazing and then you read it, sometimes you're just like, it was fine. <laughs> Things I liked about it was, um, I did find Ellingham Academy, like, it's an interesting setting. It is this playpen of this intensely rich man, so it has all of these hidden aspects to it, and that's something that I think is inherently, like, really fun to explore. Um, I found Stevie interesting as a main character, um, and this drive that she has to, to, to discover things and work out mysteries and that kind of thing. And I was, I mean, I'm really intrigued by this main Ellingham mystery at the heart. Some of my critiques of it were that, um, frankly, I could not be any less invested in the romance of this book if I tried. I am deeply uninterested in it, and I find the love interest intensely annoying. So that's my own thing. If you like their, their thing, then you'll get on better with the book, but I could not care less. Um, also, my, my main thing is that... I expected the main mystery to not be solved because there I know there's technically four books but the three of them are about the Ellingham Academy mystery so I, I had sort of signed up to not getting the answers to there I also feel like we didn't and people talk about it as if it's a cliffhanger they're like book one ends on a cliffhanger I would argue that book one just doesn't give you anything you get half of a mystery solved and that annoys me in some ways because, um, I mean, I, I read this book very quickly. I found it a very quick read. I found it a very engaging and easy read. Like, I was gripped. So in some ways, maybe I shouldn't complain. For me, it didn't feel so much like a cliffhanger so much as, why could you not just solve this mystery in this book? Why do I have to read a second book to get any answers, I think, is how I feel. That said, I'm going to read the second book. <laughs> so maybe that's the whole point. I don't know. I think it's that thing where I've ended it and I don't feel like I've come away and been like, oh my god, what an amazing cliffhanger. I feel like I've come away and have been like, I'm disappointed that I didn't get more. But I can't deny that I had a really fun time and I really enjoyed it. So, what can you do? Uh, transitioning onto my non-fiction section, I read on my phone, on Libby, I read The Queer Bible by uh, Jack Guinness. This is essentially an anthology of uh, queer writers who are essentially just writing about foundational queer figures in their life. Um, with most anthologies, it all comes down to like do you vibe with each person's writing style there were a bunch of these which were totally fine to read i had a really fun time reading them they've not really stayed with me some of them are a bit lighter in style than i particularly prefer but that is fine because it's that's not it's not supposed to be a super serious essay collection i did make a note of the people whose contributions i particularly enjoyed and i just wanted to like particularly call those out so um, Lady Phil talks about Mood Gober, Munro Bergdorf's um, chapter on Paris is Burning, Paula Akpan on Black British Lesbians, Hans Ulrich Oberist on Eva Felix Gonzalez Torres, and also uh, Amelia Abraham's chapter on Susan Sontag. Those were the ones that I particularly enjoyed because those are the ones that have a style and a focus and an exploration of things that I find particularly engaging. I do think that a real plus of this anthology is because there is um, a variety of contributors and of styles. Um, whatever your preferred essay style is, I think you'll probably find a couple of contributors who like are writing in it. And um, another thing is that um, there were a lot of uh, people that were talked about who I, I was already quite familiar with, but there were people that have really introduced me to new things, which I really appreciate. So there was, there was a whole bunch of pluses about this. I just think that um, those were the essays that, for me, were the ones that really stood with me. Um, I did a tangentially related reading moment as well, which is because of reading Amelia Abraham's essay on Susan Sontag, I also read Notes on Camp, because she talked about this um, in her essay. So then it was really interesting to consume this with everything that she had said in mind and I don't know I think maybe it might have made me enjoy this maybe more than I might have because it just gave me a lot of context to Susan Sontag's own life and then um, what the reception of this was because this is essentially two pieces the first one is Susan Sontag it's, it's like a list 
um, but like a list of like paragraphs and that kind of thing that is um, talking about the concept of camp and trying to define camp and exploring what camp is. Um, and it was really interesting to read it with Amelia Abraham's con commentary in mind about how like it was really controversial at the time to be even talking about homosexuality and um, in a positive way as having brought something new to the world and that kind of thing. So um, I definitely had like an informed reading moment and I'm really pleased that I ended up doing it this way around um, because I just think it, they meant that they fed into each other quite well. So that was really good. And then the final book I wanted to mention just passingly is my partner lent me Atlas of Stateless Nations in Europe, Minority Peoples in Search of Recognition, which is by Mikhail Podlor Pemles, which is essentially um, just like a little introduction to a bunch of stateless nations in Europe. Um, this very much started at the points where I'm like the most familiar, which would be like um, Celtic nations and that kind of thing, and then it like went through. Um, this I don't have a huge amount to say on this because it's kind of just like a little intro, like for example, here's Scotland, here's some information about it, here's like a brief history, here's like some timelines and stuff to do with like language, that kind of thing. Um, I really appreciated being introduced to a whole bunch of like stateless nations, minority peoples that I didn't know about before, that was really good. My geography is terrible, so because they include maps, that was really helpful to me. <laughs> One thing I will just say about this is it's not the best translation, there were moments when there were just still things in French, which was fine, but um, just flagging. Um, so yeah, just a brief tiny mention, but um, it was interesting. That's everything I wanted to talk about in this book chat. I know I've covered a few more than I normally do, but hopefully it's not been too long. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these. If you have any, please do leave a comment down below. It's always nice to hear from you. Uh, otherwise, I will see you next time for something different.